the story I'm about to tell you is one of the most tangled, twisted cases I have ever had the misfortune to work on. It reads like something straight out of a Hollywood script, but sometimes reality has got a way of outdoing fiction. It all began on a cold January night in 1989. The city had an icy chill that seemed to seep into your bones. The sky was murky gray, threatening snow. That was the night I got the call that would drag me into the labyrinthine saga of Carolyn Mormus. Me? My name's not important. I'm a private eye. Carolyn Bormas, a 25-year-old insurance heiress, was in the affluent suburbs of New York, living the high life as if she was riding a roller coaster, until the inevitable drop. Born into a world of luxury, she was used to getting what she wanted, and what she wanted this time was Paul Solomon, a fellow teacher at Greenville Elementary. Solomon was 17 years her senior, a man with a domineering presence and a reputation for being possessive, clinging to people and things like a vine that chokes the life out of whatever it touches. He was married to Betty Jean, a woman described as quiet and reclusive, someone who gradually lost her spark under Warmus's shadow. The relationship between Warmus and Solomon was the kind of scandalous affair that would have made the page of any tabloid. Solomon promised Warmus he'd leave his wife as soon as their teenage daughter Kristen graduated from high school. But patience isn't a virtue for a woman scorned, and Warmus was not willing to wait. On the night of January 15, 1989, Paul Solomon found his wife, Betty Jean, dead on the living room floor of their home, shot nine times. Solomon had an alibi. He claimed to have been out bowling, but his story quickly unraveled under questioning. He eventually admitted he'd been with Warmus that night, having drinks, and later, more intimately, in his car. The revelation cast a dark shadow over Warmus, turning a scandalous affair into a murder investigation. This is when I arrived at the crime scene a modest suburban home, now marked by tragedy. The place was crawling with uniforms and forensics, the yellow tape fluttering in the cold breeze like a grim banner. Inside the scene was stark. Betty Jean lay sprawled on the floor, her blood soaking into the carpet. It was a brutal, execution-style killing, the kind that spoke of rage and personal vendettas. Carolyn Mormus was no stranger to controversy. Born on January 8, 1964, in Troy, Michigan, she was the daughter of Thomas Warmus, a successful insurance executive worth over $150 million. Carolyn had lived a life of privilege, with homes, yachts, jets, and all the luxuries greenbacks could buy. She had a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Michigan and later earned a degree in teaching from Columbia University. But Carolyn's personal life was a mess. She had a history of chasing older, unattainable men and took rejection about as well as a moth to the flame until it gets burned. One such incident involved Paul Laven, a teaching assistant in Michigan who broke things off with her to get engaged to another student. Carolyn didn't handle it gracefully. She began contacting Laven at home and work, even breaking into the new couple's apartment, leaving a threatening note for his fiance. This behavior led to a restraining order, but the pattern of obsessive attachment didn't stop there. In 1987, Carolyn met Paul Solomon, and the affair began faster than a spark ignites tinder. Solomon, despite being married for nearly 20 years, was drawn to Carolyn. They started their illicit relationship, with Solomon promising he'd leave Betty Jean once their daughter graduated. 
Friends of Betty Jean described Solomon as possessive and domineering, traits that seemed to have driven a wedge between him and his wife. The murder of Betty Jean Solomon whipped the media into a frenzy. It had all the elements of a blockbuster. A wealthy young heiress, a torrid affair with an older married man, and a brutal murder. The press dubbed it the Fatal Attraction Murder, drawing eerie parallels to the 1987 film where a woman spurned by her lover becomes homicidal with jealousy. The case was splashed across headlines, with every sordid detail scrutinized, held under a magnifying glass by a rumor-hungry world. Carolyn Warmus, with her privileged background and history of obsessive behavior, was painted as the femme fatale, the woman who would do anything to remove the obstacle standing between her and her lover. But the details of the case were far from cut and dry. There were conflicting stories, deadlocked juries, and a contentious piece of evidence submitted three years after the murder. The more I dug into Carolyn's past, the more I realized how complex and convoluted the case really was, like a murder mystery novel missing the final page. As the investigation progressed, Paul Solomon's behavior came under scrutiny. After Betty Jean's death, he severed ties with Warmus on his lawyer's advice and quickly found a new girlfriend. This abrupt shift in his personal life raised eyebrows, but it was Warmus who attracted most of the suspicion. Five months after the murder, Solomon and his new girlfriend went on vacation to Puerto Rico. Warmus, undeterred, followed them there, claiming Solomon had invited her. Solomon, of course, denied this, saying she was stalking him and reported her to the police. This incident shifted the investigation's focus from Solomon as a suspect to Warmus as the possible perpetrator. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly coming together. Warmus had a history of obsessive behavior and had been deeply involved with Solomon. The motive was clear, jealousy and the desire to remove Betty Jean from the picture. But proving it in court would be as difficult as convincing a black widow to go vegetarian. In February 1990, just over a year after Betty Jean's death, Carolyn Warmus was indicted for her murder. The trial began in January 1991, and the courtroom was packed with reporters and spectators eager to see the real-life drama unfold. The prosecution painted Warmus as a woman scorned, willing to do anything to get Betty Jean out of the picture. They brought in Vincent Parco, a private investigator who claimed Warmus had previously tried to hire him to find compromising information about another married man she was dating. Harko testified that Warmus had bought a 25 caliber gun with a silencer days before Betty Jean's death, the same kind of weapon used in the murder. Would have been nice to know about that earlier, but that's a tricky tightrope for a private eye. If you turn in your clients to the authorities, you likely won't get any future clients. It's a balancing act between client confidentiality and criminal justice. Even with Parco's testimony, though, the case against Warmus was largely circumstantial. There was no physical evidence tying her directly to the crime. The jury was deadlocked, unable to convict on the prosecution's arguments alone, and the whole affair ended in a mistrial. The case against Carolyn Warmus wasn't over, though. Less than a year later, in January 1992, a new trial began. This time, the prosecution had new evidence, a bloody glove that supposedly belonged to Warmus. Paul Solomon claimed to have found it in his home three years after his wife's murder. The introduction of this glove was highly contentious. Warmus's attorney, William Ehrenwald, argued that its sudden appearance was suspicious. The glove hadn't been available during the first trial, 
and there was no way to determine if it had been tampered with. Despite these concerns, the glove became a crucial piece of evidence in the second trial. The jury deliberated for six days, and this time, the accusation stuck. Carolyn Warmus was found guilty of second-degree murder. She begged for leniency, clutching at excuses like a drowning person reaching for driftwood, insisting she didn't kill Betty Jean Solomon. But the judge handed down the maximum sentence, 25 years to life. Following her conviction, Carolyn Warmus maintained her innocence, a broken record nobody wanted to hear. She insisted that she was a victim, manipulated by Solomon, and wrongfully accused of a crime she didn't commit. Her life behind bars was far from easy. Over two decades into her sentence, Warmus discovered she had a massive brain tumor. The prison system's limited medical resources meant her treatment options were restricted. Warmus was denied parole multiple times, each time refusing to admit guilt for a crime she said she didn't commit. Her fight for freedom continued, driven by the belief that the truth would eventually come to light. In 2019, after spending nearly 30 years in prison, Carolyn Warmus was released on parole. She underwent multiple surgeries for her brain tumor, both during her incarceration and afterward. Now free, Warmus is determined to clear her name. She's been pushing for DNA testing on multiple items from the crime scene, including the contentious glove. To date, no testing has been done. Warmus's release brought the case back into the spotlight, though. The questions that had plagued the investigation from the beginning remained unanswered. Was Warmus a cold-blooded killer, or was she a victim of a flawed justice system? The truth, like the shadowy streets of the city, remained elusive. As I sit in my dimly lit office, the case files spread out before me. I can't help but reflect on the twists and turns of the warmest case. It's a tale of passion, betrayal, and murder. A case that'll be studied for decades by law students, police cadets, and those who find true crime mysteries entertaining somehow. But more tragic is that it's also a case that will continue to haunt those involved for years to come. <laughs>